Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. This is episode number 430 of Daily Global Insights. And you asked and he is back. Sridhar Chityalaji is joining me as we look at the world. Much water has flown down the river Potomac in front of which I am standing. To my right behind me is Washington Memorial. To my left behind me is Lincoln Memorial. This country was shaped and formed by these people who stood for some ideals how well or how good is United States managing itself today? We're going to be asking this main question of Sridhar Ji. Sridhar Ji, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel. Namaskar and uh, good evening and good morning to everybody. Sridhar Ji, a lot of sobering thoughts. Now we are, uh, you know, getting towards another election cycle. And how many things we predicted right at the beginning of our DGI episodes that the U.S. is going to H-E-L-L in a handbasket and it has been proven true. So we are going to start with a slide deck, Sridhar Ji, with your permission. So let me load the slide deck and we can start talking about the various issues around the world that we need to be looking at. But before all that, viewers, we have put in a lot of effort to give you some uh, jitsi uh, uh, graphics and music. So please like this video and you will not be disappointed. This is going to be a cracker of a session. Let's go ahead, sir. Israel at war, we all know that it started after the Hamas invasion on the 7th of October. Now, Sridharji, this terrorist organization like Hamas, let's step back a little bit, go back in time. Who allowed them to set up their headquarters in Qatar? U.S. is supposed to have been the policeman around that time, sir. What happened? <coughs> well, I think it's fascinating. Um, again, you know, uh, all arrows point to uh, President Obama uh, and his during his regime back in 2012. Uh, they decided that they should have a representative office for Hamas in Qatar. Uh, with an intent that they can uh, address some of the issues in the Palestinian territories and also their belief was uh, that they would be able to keep an oversight uh, on some of the activities that Hamas was engaged in. Uh, lo and behold, uh, whether that was the case or whether it turned out to be something different, uh, 10 years later, now we are beginning to uh, look at uh, the unfolding events that's commenced on October 7th. Uh, we covered a lot of these issues, if you recall, going back in the first half, the formation of uh, Sahel region and various types of activities. And uh, there again, you had the clear stamp of uh, President Obama uh, going back, uh, due to, you know, going back to his period. And now we are seeing the resurgence of the far right in Europe with the, uh, you know, election of uh, Netherlands just throwing up a right-wing candidate like Geert Wilders. Sir, he has been uh, consistently preaching that, you know, Muslims are a threat to Europe. And we've also been saying this thing, 2015, as early as 2015, eight years ago, Professor Arvi and I, we coined the term called Eurobia, E-U-R-O-B-I-A. And uh, it's been very consistent. Somehow people don't want to wake up. They are acting pretending to be asleep at the wheel. Now things are getting really nasty. Um, Sridharji, you've got experience, extensively traveled through you know, uh, to Europe. Uh, how do you see this thing playing? Will he be allowed to form the government? Because still negotiations are going on as far as I know. Well, I think that he will, he will eventually form the government. Um, and primarily, I think that there are three major issues uh, shaping Europe, which is why you have seen uh, Gert, as well as uh, Orban and Meloni and Robert Fico emerge. I think the first and foremost uh, issue is what they call as the invasion to stop the invasion of Europe, which is all the kind of illegal immigration and the consequent social and uh, law and order issues that are springing up. I think that's the first and foremost. Second, there is very, very little support for the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, Europe itself is in lots of uh, you know financial strife. Uh, there is going to be less support coming from Europe uh, in terms of the funding of the war. What started as a U.S. Uh, supported Ukraine, Russia, uh, this uh, conflict is now the burden is being borne on two fronts. One, the energy consequences and second is the economic consequences of funding the war. So I think that uh, there is a lot of resistance and a lot of discontent uh, that is prevalent as a result of uh, 
this specific issue which is confronting everybody ji um sridhar ji before we go to the next topic i'm also hearing that close to 65% of the oil that russia used to pump to the western europe is still being pumped sir despite all these sanctions well i think that uh, again you know if you recall we discussed this specific topic it comes in one of two ways it comes uh, either you know the existing supplies continue uh, albeit uh, circumnavigating some of the uh, sanctions uh, that the g7 nation had imposed the second is that it goes to other territories gets refined and if you recall russia said it will find ways by which it can ferry this back into into europe so therefore you know the uh, the so called alternative energy has not worked united states has not been able to supply or augment the supply the middle east is completely locked out so they have no choice but to be reliant on russia to continue to uh, light their homes and remember we are getting into winter now Yes, indeed, and that's going to be a very interesting situation. Now, United States population shift again. One of the things that we've been starting from the day one of the Biden administration that what they are doing is wrong. Yours, you may not know how much we had predicted, how accurately we predicted. So, either the especially in the forefront, as a matter of fact, after one episode where the Biden administration stopped the press from going to the press to the to the I'm sorry to the Uh, uh, border of Mexico and covering the illegals just walking through no customs gates no borders no nothing this joke went on for a week or so and and finally senators landed there they started taking videos then only the world knew that this illegal immigration was going on this was at the height of covid can you believe it so this is what has happened now now we are saying we are seeing that there is a border surge in fact there are areas where the the custom custom and border patrol agents have been asked to break the wire fence so that they can let people in it has become um, you know just a mess the joke of uh, legal immigration where has while you have all these people just walking in you also have a 15 year waiting period for green card for indian uh, uh origin people and it's even longer for philippines see see that this is the pet peeve i can go on for the entire session sir i will yield the floor to you when is this madness going to stop sir i think it's too late the flood gates have been uh, have opened uh if people are not aware of the numbers i'm sure they are aware of the numbers uh today we have uh you know close to 15 million that's roughly 15% of the us population has immigrants comprising of legal and illegal immigrants and just in biden's period he has normalized and settled 4.5 million people which is probably close to population of two small states in united states this is the highest that anyone has seen in the recent us history probably going back to 100 years so sri ji i think the flood gates have opened and you can see the numbers the day is not far off when you have 20 probably even 25% of the population comprising of legal and illegal immigrants given that so many of them are still awaiting normalization process uh the number is somewhere between 12 to 14 million uh what i have heard in terms of awaiting normalization but living in united states this concept of catch and release catch and release uh is basically creating not only a law and order problem but it is also creating a very huge economic problem because there is no mechanism to fund these people either for the shelter or for the food or for the healthcare needs uh, sridhar ji you and i live in two of the worst woke states uh, california and new york i'm putting ours first because i think california is worse than in uh, new york having bigger size and bigger population and and what we are seeing on the streets is frankly scary that's all i can say so many illegal uh, you know hot pants coming up and now it is winter time talk to us a little bit about how things are in new york city because now the mayor is also throwing up his hands and say i don't have money to pay for all these people staying in five star hotels so he, he has thrown them on the streets and they have taken up residence outside the city building i heard New York is in a pretty bad state 
Manhattan, more specifically, is in a pretty bad state. Uh, as you correctly said, Eric Adams, the mayor, has effectively stated, well, I don't have capacity to uh, to house you. So therefore, if you can find how if you if you can find a place to stay, no issues, you can stay. So many of them are occupying streets. We had covered, you know, in the earlier episodes of uh, DGI, uh, the prime five star hotel right in the center of Times Square being vacated and given room. And I, that still is the case. They are moving quite a number of people to Brooklyn area. They have also tried to move people to Staten Island. A Democratic House representative was agitating that these illegals are creating socioeconomic problems and law and order problems, especially around the schools. This is Democrats, you know, um, are shouting at the top of the voice to Mr. Biden that this cannot go on. You cannot move people into these areas. This is not allowed. And you need to have a much more orchestrated program. There's no orchestration. There's just chaos. Sridharji, the Democrats must be really asking themselves, uh, you know, uh, did we not realize the consequences of our actions? Now, there is another worst thing that is happening, sir. Both uh, cities in California as well as in New York are mulling, allowing the illegals to vote, just like it is done in the United Kingdom. For even civic, uh, even for city elections, they cannot vote. How can they vote? They are not here on legal um, grounds, and they want to make them to vote, sir. I mean, I don't. You and I don't have enough time in the day to fight all these battles, and these guys are blissfully just carrying forward that is, as if nothing is going to stop them. What is? I mean, why is the gov Why first of all, why is the U.S. population continuing to repose faith in Democrats? They need to be taught a lesson, in my opinion. I'm an independent, sir. I feel like these guys have to be taught a lesson. Well, I think we go back to the uh, the election <laughs> saga of 2020, or we go back to what is going to be the saga in 2024, uh, the unfolding saga next year. You know, uh, which is we'll be covering quite extensively as we step into 2024. Uh, is there going to be? You know, when I say legitimate elections, which is namely. Uh, I, what I mean by that is, you know, uh, are there going to be fair electorate? Are there going to be valid IDs? Are the machines going to work? Is the counting going to be done where you have fair representation from either side? So all this unfolding drama. And there is also another unfolding drama, which is the number of cases that are being filed left, right and center against President Trump or the former President Trump, who continues to lead by a whooping 60%. And the next is only somewhere around 10 and a half to 12 percent. Uh, that is, you know, that is a tug of war between uh, DeSantis and Nick Haley. But right there, President Trump at 60 percent. And in fact, one attorney has stated if he wins the election or if he contests the elections, there is no way cases can be conducted because it's interpol interference. So you have that side. And then you have on the Democrat side, the um, the Middle Eastern people with Middle Eastern background threatening Mr. Biden. If he doesn't call for ceasefire, he's not going to get their votes in the elections. So very interesting set of issues that we are going to be facing as we step into 2024 elections, uh, Sriji. And, and many of these so-called Middle East uh, Democrats uh, have a rap sheet this long. They need to be first examining their own record of how they got into this country in the first place. That's all I will say. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, the rat race continues within the Republican Party. You touched upon this, sir. Nikki yep. Haley, what exactly does she have that uh, makes uh, the donor so uh, you know, enamored of her candidacy? Uh, the uh, Koch brothers are, uh, you know, who historically are big supporters of the Republican Party are behind uh, uh, Nikki Haley. And uh, there's some uh, tensions as we got into this program, whether they, you know, whether, they, whether all of them would like to support her. But what is it? What is it that uh, works for uh, Nikki Haley? Firstly, foremost, she served in the administration. Uh, she was the UN uh, rep, and she's also well considered within the Republican Party. So there are many things that she's part of the establishment. She seems a very credible, rather than uh, you know shaking the trees and. Uh, you know, trying to be very uh, controversial. DeSantis' performance has been very modest to poor in terms of, uh, you know, his sense of presence and trying to persuade the voters. I don't know whether 
he has had any anti-Trump stance or whether by himself is not able to uh, demonstrate uh, the leadership that is required to be presidential candidate. Everybody expected him to be walk away number one, but the poll numbers don't indicate that. Yes, indeed. And uh, Biden is also having problems of his own. He's been trying to put a lid on the various scams, but they still keep coming out. Uh, Sridharji, again, uh, towards the end of our DJ episodes, we have talked about NCAST checks in Wells Fargo. These are these are all documented uh, data. Uh, that was, again, you know, a year and a half ago when we had la last left the DGI. Why is it taking so long for a Republican-controlled Congress to move on some of these uh, black and white, in my opinion, uh, crimes? Data, data, data. That's controlled by FBI, DOJ, uh, any enforcement that needs to happen, uh, the DOJ has to come in. Uh, and they've been very reluctant in terms of offering the information. If you go back in time when the Republicans were in minority, uh, remember Janet Allen said that I will not be releasing the information to you. The Treasury Secretary said that I will not be releasing the information. It has to come through the formal, the House um, uh, Financial Committee. And then only then we will release that information. It didn't turn out. So now we have the same logger jam. They don't know which issue to confront. There's so many issues that uh, the Republicans face. Republicans themselves are divided in the House. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that what is going to happen is the Democrats will unseat Biden, not the Republicans, if there is going to be um, a new nominee emerging. And I still feel there will be a new nominee emerging and it will not be Biden. And a lot of this noise that you are hearing is actually coming from Democrats more than the Republicans. Sridharji, your choice or your picks of two names that might emerge. Michelle Obama. Only one. Only one. <laughs> Michelle Obama. <laughs> well, 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 well. You know, unfinished business as far as Mr. Obama is concerned. I hope this doesn't happen. But, well, stranger things have happened in the United States politics. Um, let's take a look at Chinese high altitude balloon saga. Again, this is something that we had covered extensively. Now, the Chinese defense report links high altitude balloon program to hypersonic missiles and a command center near space. And the US is <laughs> denying the existence of such a center. So where is this center located, Sridharji? Beijing. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Beijing. Well, recall uh, when this balloon went up, there was all hoobla around that this is nothing, some kind of a science uh, research balloon that went astray. Uh, and, you know, somebody, the first balloon was shot, then the second balloon was almost in the center um, uh, of cent uh, center of United States. That again was uh, taken down. And um, I think one was taken down in Canada. One was taken down uh, around the U.S. border on the other side, having, having, having traveled all the way. Um, now, we had indicated that this is not some kind of research balloon, but it is definitely some kind of um, you know, mission critical uh, defense or uh, surveillance type of a balloon. Now it is coming out that it is their hypersonic missile program. So they have a defense program and they have a hypersonic missile program, which is through the balloons. These, these are the two um, integrated uh, command centers that is being run out of Beijing. And they believe that using this, they will be able to punish nations uh, mercilessly, this is the exact verbiage that is being uh, cited or quoted in the press release from China, Sriji, by the, the China Defense Report. So there is a lot of hot air also. So we have to wait and see, sir. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of, uh, uh, many of the missiles are falling on their own and their submarines have, uh, uh, you know, gotten damaged. The latest state-of-the-art ship was on fire recently. So we will wait and we will give you more details there, uh, viewers. Now, let us take a look at India's economic search. Uh, the market capitalization of the BSC listed companies has just crossed the 4 trillion mark. And I hope you watched my hangout with Palaksha in the morning today, where we talked about the NSC co-location scam. 
and how the CBI has spectacularly bungled it. This is not our observation. It was the High Court, Bombay High Court's observation as to how they bungled it. So do watch that one also. On the one side, you have the markets growing. On the other side, you're having all these shenanigans going unchecked and, and people are not being punished. Very, very disappointing on that angle. But let us look at the growth story of uh, India. Over to you, Sridhar Ji. Well, I think the, um, the, the two, three important observations here, you know, one, the first and foremost observation is that usually the markets grow in conjunction with the economy of the country because, you know, it's much more um, what we call, you know, public markets. Um, and so it's commensurate with India moving towards the $4 trillion. Um, the market cap of uh, $4 trillion dollars is a good number, but this has to be set within the context of what the global market cap of the stock market is. So the global market cap is about $110 trillion. The United States is the dominating with about $56, $60 uh, trillion of market cap in US. The second is obviously China, somewhere around $10 trillion. But very important to keep two numbers in context. Uh, Chinese um, you know, market cap to GDP ratio is almost 50%. Uh, whereas India's and United States market cap is well north of 100%. This just basically shows the commie regimes in China still have a tight leash. They do not want, uh, you know, public markets overshooting itself and trying to dictate terms to the government. Again, if we go back to the DJ programs, we've touched on this topic as to how China intervened. But coming back to India, um, there was a lot of, um, negative skepticism and criticism as to whether India will do 6% or 6.2%. Though it is um, projected as 6.2%, my belief is India will finish somewhere between 7 and 8% because of two factors. Uh, first and foremost is that there's been tremendous amount of government spending. And second, Backed by that, you have seen a number of companies making investments, capital investments into India, which in turn is boosting the economy. Is obviously the new data factor is usually it is uh, rural consumption, but there seems to be the pent up demand and the urban consumption is also driving the growth, which is what uh, resulted in the 7.6% uh, in the July, July to September quarter. And the markets are expected to do very well in 2024, again, consistent with both the res uh, election results as well as uh, the general buoyancy in the, in the mindset of the people. Uh, well, again, one small request to all of our viewers, please like this video. I hope by now you have watched the video and you are convinced that the quality is very good. Um, sometimes some of you ask snarky questions to us saying that how can you ask us to like a video without watching the video? Well, there are 430. This is the 430th episode of Daily Global Insights. And from the request that we got to resume this, it took a fair amount of work. Sridharji is a very busy man. He's a globe trotter, Ulagam Sitrum Valiban. That means a young man who trots around the globe. And, and we had to work quite a bit to make sure that we have a consistent pattern of programs. We're going to be having two programs a week, one on Tuesdays, another one on Saturdays. And if Tuesdays are not possible, we'll make up that program on Thursday. So we'll keep you informed viewers. But you can give us a lot of encouragement. Just like this video and also put in by way of comments how you like the content that we are presenting in DGI. So let's move on to this Gurpatwan Singh Pannu case. Interestingly, now suddenly Biden seems to be quite satisfied, or I should say Blinken, uh, about the progress of the investigation of this case in the Indian government, which has said that they are going to be appointing a high-level committee. Uh, Sridharji, I have expressed my doubts about the whole thing that if somebody is going to bump somebody off, they are not going to pay you, meet the person and then give the cash. And it sounds a little far-fetched, Sridharji. Your thoughts? Well, I think we covered, uh, uh, you know, I endorse your views. We covered it in our, uh, you know, the single monologue that we did. Um, all this committee and other stuff means it's gone into the back burner. It will soon dissipate uh, and maybe evaporate into, into backwaters. Uh, so therefore, uh, I think that this is it's over. Um, we will move on, and the world will move on. And gladly to glad to see the loudmouth, you know, taking a break for a change. So that's a good sign. Now, 
This is an interesting one. There was a radio, there is a radio host, Harnik Singh, and three Khalistani extremists have been convicted for the attempted murder of Harnik Singh, a renewed, I think it's renowned, I should say, radio host based in Auckland, New Zealand, for his outspoken criticism of the Khalistan ideology. Sir, these are nothing but street thugs, sir. Street thugs. I think that the uh, the the objective of uh, sharing this news is there seems to be a consistent pattern. So they kind of triggered all these elements around the world at the same time, and I think people are fi- facing the consequences. Uh, notwithstanding, you remember the uh, New Zealand is part of the Five Eyes, uh, and they're supposed to be one of the key people who gave evidence or information, according to Canadian Prime Minister Mr. Trudeau. But here is a classic example of these guys getting caught and being punished right in the heart of New Zealand, which is Auckland. So very important to know that these guys are getting caught uh, wherever there is, uh, they can see um, any kind of violation of law. Um, So very interesting development within the context of uh, what we are seeing in Australia, New Zealand, uh, United States, Canada. Uh, Britain and even parts of Europe, Sriji, with regard to um, this uh, extremist group. Yes, indeed. Uh, Italy, they have a lot of a large presence in Italy that people don't tend to uh, you know, talk about. Asia update. Keeping China, North Korea in focus, several nations led by Philippines, Thailand and Vietnam are signing deals with various nations to bolster their security. A case and example is uh, India and Philippines. They are looking at Tejas, they are looking at some other uh, weaponry. Brahmos is another one that they are interested in. Sridharji, one minute on this and then we'll take a few questions there and then call it a wrap. Over to you. Well, I think that um, uh, first and foremost, um, South China Sea has has continued to be the focus. Uh, The fact that Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam are engaged in this. Uh, Remember that United States and Philippines also conducted recently a joint exercises uh, which irritated the Chinese to uh, no small extent. Um, and it's very also interesting that there was a very, very um, poignant observation made by uh, JP Morgan CEO. Um, should United States government ask JP Morgan to pull out of China, uh, it will, it will uh, in the interest of the nation. All these points out that China is being given a stern warning on Taiwan. So there's very, very close activity between neighbors who have dispute with China and then United States itself, which says that it will deploy uh, its ground-based missiles in Indo-Pacific in 2024. I think there's a treaty. I forget the exact name of the treaty. Uh, It's called as the... Uh, independent nuclear force treaty where uh, it was signed between the United States and Russia and the treaty expired in 2019 that they would not have ballistic missiles with nuclear capabilities uh, located and with range between 550 miles to 2000 miles. Um, But the treaty has expired now. United States is saying that it will have its forces, ballistic missile force, capabilities in Indo-Pacific. And in the meanwhile, China itself has built its own uh, capabilities. So therefore, I think all sides are getting ready. Uh, but the hope is that it will uh, it will not trigger any action. And uh, South China Sea will continue to continue to be remain what it is. Disputes, but not a threat. Thank you so much, Sridharji. With your permission, may I ask a few questions from our customers, uh, our viewers, sir? Sure. We have about three or four. We are just going to take those and then we'll wrap it up, sir. First question. Uh, can you have the questions, please? Partha wants to know, what is Paul going to do next? And what is the future of Taiwan now that TSMC Japan plant is operational from Q2 2024? Well, what's Paul going to do? We, uh, Paul, we predicted that Paul said that the immediate rate reduction uh, is not feasible given the still that there is inflationary pressures. Um, and we'll cover this uh, over the weekend. Uh, but to 2024, middle of 2024, we can we can begin to see early signs of tapering, but it will be much slower uh, given both inflation and unemployment remains low, high employment 
and uh, you know the inflation still is fairly high um, we are not anywhere close to 4% band as yet uh, so i think that you will uh, but economy has not uh, you know faltered we have not had a crash landing we have not had a hard landing again we predicted that it would be uh, neutral or uh, soft and i think that seems to be the trend so powell is not going to do anything and he has been uh, having a you know watching brief um, and keeping a keeping a close eye as far as future of taiwan is concerned i think uh, there's a lot of support um, whether xi jinping will blink we don't know but at least the indications are given his own state of economy he may not move as far as TM, tsmc is concerned it has been building up capabilities there are also indications that they would have a plant in india they will also have a plant in united states and europe outside of japan um so i think that tsmc is also expanding its global footprint uh, minimizing any kind of disruption as a result of um, any um, you know mis uh, mischief from the chinese thank you so much sir let's go to the next question prabhakar joshi ji thank you for becoming a youtube member next question please magnet ranga wants to know namaskaram the west may reverse their refugee policy but that may hardly change the situation uh, in, uh, what more could these nations do to see real changes i'm not sure what uh, real changes are i think we are in a very difficult situation uh, you know there is cultural misalignment um there is no capacity um especially either europe or west deeply in debt um you know to fund and finance so we're going to have social upheaval for a period of time uh before self normalization occurs the governments have no capability to address the issues emerging from this major major refugee crisis remember all these refugees are coming to west nobody is going to the most affluent arabic nations they are not going well they are not taking to right see the thing is the arabic nations will speak with bullets and guns they'll just sink the ships that are trying to come to their shores sir we are all worried about democracy and right to life and all that stuff but people also forget that all these things exist within a legal framework once you break that then you know how do you control things that's where the problem is next question yeah. I, so just to uh, wrap that one the yeah. fundamental issue sri ji is that there is no cultural integration there is no integration at the society level they remain in the ghettos that's the fundamental problem so if you want to create mini islands of sudan somalia uh, you know uh, palestine uh and uh, jordan uh and iraq uh, and afghanistan in the united states then there is that's not going to happen uh it has not happened anywhere in the world that's that's where the fundamental issue is that there is no cohesive integration of this population not willingness of the people to integrate well even you know uh, someone of my average intellect can see the dangers of this and I'm, i'm astonished and amazed that some of these ivy league graduates who have pedigree of people serving uh, for generations in politics don't seem to be able to catch this simple fact but anyway who are we to say we we elect them so we have to pay for that uh, the other side wants to know is the far right in europe us good enough to fix the damage done by systematic de destruction of socio economic values in these countries the answer is no what we are going to see is that i think we again touched on this the floodgates are open you look at france you look at belgium you look at germany uh, you look at uk britain uh, you can see that there are pockets and pockets and pockets of what we call the islands of concentrated uh, you know um, um, cities of uh, people with specific demographics so i think that what you may witness is the two things the far right will do one stop or try to stem the rate of flow that's number one number two that there could be a uh, realignment of population or movement of population into into favorable regions as i call for example during covid when we had economic catastrophe in new york 
New York lost about close to 30% of the population. Many of them moved to Texas and Florida. So you may see shifts in uh, population from one place to another place. Europe is fairly big, but they're not going to be able to stem the damage because of the, just the issues that we talked about. Next one, please. Um, Mr. Lee wants to know, what is your opinion on Matthew Iglesias' thesis of 1 billion Americans to counter China? Is that, if that is adopted, wouldn't the U.S. completely absorb populations of Israel and Taiwan? No, I think it's a very uh, far-fetched uh, um, idea. Uh, these things, um, you know, are not, uh, you know, currently U.S. population is about 350 million or 340 to 350 million. You know, it has to be three times. Um, and even with illegals, we are seeing a rate of about, you know, three to four million uh, United States today has no capacity, economic capacity. Its debt burden is so high. Um, you know, again, we'll cover this in the uh, on the market story. The interest costs on the balance sheet of the U.S. is so so high, uh, and it's. I mean, if you are a Democrat, you know, you want to spend money. If you are a Republican, you want to balance. There's no mechanism to balance the budget, uh, which is like a runaway train wreck. Yes, indeed. And uh, next question, please. Arun Raj wants to know, sir, who are the unknown friends of India who are killing our enemies in Pakistan? I, I don't have an answer to this question, Sriji. <laughs> next question, please. This is the last one. No more, please. Uh, Neeraj Kulkarni wants to know, when will recession hit USA and the world in 2024-25? Will it be a soft landing? Will it hasten de-dollarization? We'll answer all these questions in our Saturday episode. Sridharji, just to have the headlines for, um, for them. No, in, in India, United States will not enter recession. We have gone past the recession, uh, recession point. Uh, the earnings are good. Um, the, um, the earnings are good. The money flow is good uh, in the private sector. I'm not talking about the government in the private sector. Um, and the growth is much more um, uh, what we call as uh, uh, orthodox or organic. Um, so therefore, we, I don't, we don't expect 2024, 2025. We expect actually, if you recall, in 2023, we expected either 0% zero, zero or negative in Europe and United States. We will be either zero or positive, uh, both in Europe. Um, right now, we are trending to positive growth in 2023. We similarly will have a modest growth in 2024. So there's no question of uh, recession. Um, all basically driven by um, corporations and businesses acclimatizing themselves uh, to these high interest rates. There will always be mishaps, but the, but the growth has been sustained. Thank you so much, Sridharji. And viewers, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. And please ping your friends who have been following DGI that Sridharji is back and that we have a regular schedule back in place. And we will be doing this thing for at least till the elections in the United States, that is November 2024, but we need your support. We need to really grow fast and we are hoping that such serious content, which takes hours to get and perfect, because we need to be making sure that we are current, at the same time we are accurate, we are doing a lot of fact-checking also before we put out the data. Once again, thank you Sridharji for putting in the hard yards to make sure that we have the data to present it to our viewers. Viewers, please like, share and subscribe to our channel again and don't forget to click on the bell button for notifications. We'll see you on Saturday. Namaskar. Namaskar. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.